Good morning, everybody. It is I, the villainous valuer of vintage volumes, vying vociferously for viewership. I am here with a bunch of cheap-ass comics, a nice cigar hand-rolled by yours truly, and let's just jump right in. Oh, these are coming from uh, b b my favorite, the one, the only, the kingpin of Union Square, Howie. Hit him up, find him, he will be tagged in this video. He is the the last real dealer. I'm telling you, he's the real deal. Get out there while you can. Okay, let's see what we got. So, so far we're off to a pretty great start. Battle your brains out. Batman Forever, Tiger, handheld, complete nonsense games. Like these games, are, they were so bad. There was no gameplay to them. You know, it it was like, there were like predetermined like drawings on the screen that would light up basically, right? Like there weren't pixels. They were just like chunks of art that, that you know, oh, like they'll maybe have like a drawing of a of that leg coming out that also attaches to that drawing, but they're not pixels. It was so bad. Um, and then it being based on Batman Forever is like, oh, well, what if we can make a bad thing out of a bad thing? But yeah, there we go. So this is going to be 90s. Um, and let's see. Ah, this is great. Animaniac. So yeah, uh, saw this in the dollar bin and I was obviously going to take it. Um, I feel like I may have bought a couple copies of this. Uh, from Dollar Bins. And it's just, if I see an Animaniacs issue for a dollar, I'm taking it. Uh, this was one of my favorite cartoons uh, growing up as a family. It was always, it was the kind of thing where I didn't have to get the jokes, right? There were enough jokes for my parents that were so over my head at the time, but then it also let me catch up, you know? Uh, Animaniacs basically had a good, the entirety of Goodfellas was parodied in this, you know, uh, uh, but the pigeons. Um, yeah, Disputing with Newton. Man, I gotta read this. It's probably actually kind of fun. I should try to fill in a run of these. Okay, so this was a fun one. So this one I actually specifically bought. And what happened was, I was on the corner of Union Square. I look down and I see a dollar. It's a random dollar on the ground. So I naturally picked that up, walk it right over to Howie, and just randomly pick out a book. Look, plucked it. No look at any can't turn out to be. Youngblood Strike Force number one. So this is more night. This is, you know, uh, two very different uh, types of 90s, you know. Um, Saturday morning cartoons versus the extreme, uh, you know, pouch heavy kind of uh, Liefeld marketing uh, nonsense. Uh, so yeah. Uh, is this the actual cover? Yes, nailed it. All right, okay, so this one is 93. Yeah, so this is even earlier than, than this, you know. There's something about this, and I know, like, this is sort of... Some, this looks older to me, right? Like, the 90s-ness of this actually makes it look older than something that... This is sort of just basic, like, 1960s-style Hanna-Barbera art. And yet, for some reason, it looks more timeless. This looks... The 90s aesthetic, it was based on nothing. It wasn't based on anything anyone really wanted to see. It was based on what a very small group of people wanted to sell. So, whatever. The, the, I, I honestly don't believe Liefeld deserves any credit. And I think we give too much to McFarlane and even the guys that were good around that era. I think it's uh, Jim Lee, McFarlane, great artists. But they're, they're not, they weren't doing anything special. They really weren't. And, and it ended up flattening the industry, you know. And like I said, it, most of what they produced during that era doesn't look good. This is it's just not a, it doesn't mean anything. Nothing we're looking at in any of these pages means anything. The, like the choices that, and then, and then you start, you know, having like serious issues, like certain kinds of commentary about, you know, hate and violence and nation states and how, you know, but then, but then you're just stupid and putting rocket packs on everybody. And it kind of, kind of loses something. Okay, so let's see. What do we got here? Okay, so we're still in the 90s, right? Oh, no, this is 89. Okay, so this is... Oh, yeah. This is uh, Nintendo Nintendo, not Super Nintendo. Very fun. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so I guess this is 91. So uh, I think I've explained this before, but uh, I accidentally got uh, started in a, in a big old Superman run. So I've been trying to rebuild um, basically... What is it, the John Byrne Superman run? Uh, based from the point that he sort of picked it up uh, to the point where Superman died. Because by that point, it was already done. 
um, there was no good story, and everything was coming from editorial. So I'm basically trying to fill in um, Superman from the 80s to the death of Superman. Because I've heard there's some really great comics in there. I just know it went off the fucking rails with that death of Superman. Elf Quest. Okay, here we go. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm guessing this is an epics comic. And I kind of just been, yeah. So I've just sort of been, I know like fantasy is hot and I know that they're, I mean, I've always kind of, I've always kind of not liked fantasy as a setting to be perfectly honest. I like sci-fi, I like monsters, I like dragons, I like that kind of stuff, but I think fantasy as a setting is boring. And it's this idea of, well, let's make pe people are dumber, society is dumber, and then there's this stuff. And it just seems like, I don't know, I think a dragon existing when there are cell phones is probably a little more interesting than a dragon existing when the only form of communication was lighting a fire on the top of a mountain, right? It just feels like we dumb the stories down by using a fantasy setting. We should be using fantasy ideas in a more modern setting. Um, and so, yeah, so this was just a, a run of a, honestly, I don't know anything about it. It just seemed like generic fantasy nonsense to me, but I figured I'd, I'd grab a few and see how they are, but really just slipping through it. It looks very uninspired. It looks very archetypal, you know, which I guess is the point of fantasy, but then what's, there's really nothing for anyone to hang their hat on. Like, it's been fun trying to watch them turn uh, Dungeons & Dragons into an intellectual property, because it literally doesn't work. The reason Dungeons & Dragons is fun is because we tell the story. Me and my friends sit around and we tell the story. The character is whatever dumb shit I call it. Like, no one has a favorite D&D character that exists in D&D &D lore. Everyone's favorite, if you play D&D, &D, your favorite character is either I did something cool or, fuck, you remember when Austin made, you know, the bard that forgot how to play an instrument and then, right? Like, you know, like, everybody has this weird story. Like, everyone's favorite D&D &D story is unique to them. It's literally the opposite of an intellectual, of the kind of intellectual property you can license and actually create value by attaching it to your brand. So, I mean, honestly, I think the D&D &D movie was a scam, but here we are, another scam. Make money, get prizes. This is literally all ads are either just products that don't work or multi-level marketing or multi-level marketing for products that don't work. Um, so yeah, very fun, brave in the bold. Um, I think this is a very underrated series. Um, it, it's just one of those ones I keep seeing in dollar bins, you know, this is dollar bronze, you know, 1977. You know, this is, and I got a free Wonder Woman cupcake comic uh, from Hostess. Yeah, okay, so yeah, this is, the idea is I, I've been buying Brave and the Bold comics randomly from dollar bins since I started going to New York Comic Con over 10 years ago. And it's one of the few things where they're actually telling great stories in a single issue, which is amazing. Like it's, there are so many versions, there's so many ways we've improved the language of storytelling. Um, but we've forgotten that, like how to do that. I believe the worst thing to happen um, to modern narratives, really, it's not a comic book issue. It is, a, is an issue with all forms of content that are supposed to have a narrative and it's decompression. And it's this idea that they, like they wanna fill in the details, but yeah, that's fine when there are interesting moments, right? Think about Argo, it was a, was a, was a movie that almost like takes place in real time. I know it doesn't really, but the events of that story were so interesting that you could literally go minute by minute and it would still be interesting. Now, here's the problem. Batman isn't fucking like that. Batman does push-ups a lot. Batman does engineering. Most of what Batman does is Batman sitting and looking at a screen. And so when you decompress something and you don't focus on the interesting parts, you end up getting boring stories or you decompress it and it still is unrealistic. So it's Robert Kirkman, I think, was one of the best comic book writers because he was a compressionist. There is this eloquent panel in the beginning of 
uh, Invincible, where the kid is just trying to bring out a bag of trash and just sort of takes the bag and throwing it into the guard, and it goes flying up into the air. And you realize that he realizes he just got powers. So, one, he's not, he, like, the, the dialogue doesn't seem like finally, or like whatever. There's some sense that, one, in this one panel, you saw he was a kid who didn't have powers, he was a kid who just developed powers, and he, for some reason, thought it was bound to happen, therefore it might be a familial thing, right? Like, you're, you, you would know so much from a single panel. Smash Cut, I just read Void Rivals, a, a brand new, highly publicized Robert Kirkman comic book, and quite frankly, it didn't, it seemed to tell almost no story. And it's the exact opposite. Robert Kirkman found a way in a single panel of Invincible to tell a story that would be a three volume, you know, trade. You know, uh, you know, three trades is how you would do an origin story nowadays, because you're trying to get the most content out of the single story, but like, Kirkman did it in a panel. Nowadays, I swear, the entirety of Void Rivals is just a guy crashes on a planet with a prisoner from a race he's up against. They fight, and then they get together, right? It's, it's a movie called Enemy Mind. It's not, it's based, you know, movie Enemy Mind is based on this idea of like, the Japanese guy and the American in World War II find being stuck by themselves and having to like write it just it's just tropes so whereas Kirkman had this way of distilling and combining tropes into interesting ways back in the day the version Hasbro's paying him to do just isn't that <sighs> a little bit of ash on my Batman um, and that's the problem we're now decompressing while smoothing things out and everything just gets boring and there we go so like i said you can tell a story in one issue there's amazing brave and the bold so i'm going to tell this story all the time it's it's a brave and the bold issue i don't even know the number the idea is it's a batman superman one where immediately superman is like blasted out of reality by some dude who created some sort of ray he didn't realize that this laser beam that he created was actually a time displacement ray so he was actually sending superman back to the past and displacing Superboy. So now all of a sudden, Superman is back, you know, th 30 years in the past, and you have a teenage Superboy uh, standing next to Batman, and they have to deal with this villain. And Superboy at this point has never met Bruce Wayne. He's never met Batman, right? He's a, you know, a 16-year-old who grew up on a farm, and he's just starting to become a superhero. Now you have this old Batman who knows everything about Superman, so you have these two people, one of them knows the other one intimately. Like, ba Batman knows Superman's future, whereas Superman doesn't know Batman at all. So he has to kind of convince this young Superman that they will be friends, that they are friends, that even though you've never met me, we are together. And he does it real easily. He just says, you're, you're, you're you know, Martha, Martha and Jonathan Kent, those are your parents. How could I know that? Here's my face. I'm Bruce Wayne. You probably heard of Bruce Wayne on TV. You know, like, it's one of these things where he immediately just realizes what pieces of information he has that this child will have that they can connect on. And then, he, and then once he gets a young, confused Superboy on his side, he then has to coach this, you know, pubescent superhero into using powers in ways that Bruce had seen Clark do recently. So he has to coach Superboy through using his super hearing to lock in on a single voice of the villain they're trying to get. By the way, all of this was a single floppy. This, it's this. This is how many pages it takes to tell that kind of story. And so when I'm watching a, a, a two hour movie where nothing happens, you know, when you're taking a Harry Potter book that was already a bunch of cliches kind of spread out and you're spreading it out into seven hours across two movies, you broke the content. Every piece of content is supposed to be good on its own. None of these need to be bad. You don't need any bad pieces to make a good story. And when the first issue is boring, Void Rivals, the first issue is boring. You're boring. You did a bad job. But there you go. Good night and good luck. Stay bold, my guys.